All right, let's get on to our second panel discussion here. This is open innovation and category creation in cybersecurity. Our moderator is Mr. Matt Howard from Virtue. Matt. And our speakers are Marty Roche from Netography and Will Ackerley from Virtue. Gentlemen, please come on up. Okay, uh, John uh, Anoop and John, thank you very much for the conversation. I thought it was um, fascinating and, and enlightening on a lot of levels. And the thing I liked about it the most is that it definitely leaves us with some questions and ideas about what we can do going forward. And, and in terms of you know, DMB rising, there's some, some interesting threads to pull. Uh, so so if, if I could get everybody over there on the side, please, Carissa. Yep, thanks. Thank you. I worked really hard to get Will Ackerley and Marty Resch in this panel, and I am not going to let someone talk over us. Thank you. Um, so the, the title of the panel is Open Innovation and Category Creation in Cybersecurity. Um, and and like, like legitimately, we are really, really honored to have two unbelievably talented engineers, uh, not just engineers, but innovators with us today to kind of facilitate that discussion. I'm going to read their bios and I wouldn't normally do this. Like in my experience with these types of panels, I'm not a big fan of this, but in this case, I wanted to read their bios because they're both like legitimate, like rock stars and they don't like necessarily to talk about themselves that much. So listen to this. Marty is the CEO of Notography and a DMV-based a DMV-based cybersecurity legend with over 25 years of engineering and innovation experience. In 1998, Marty invented Snort, which quickly became the world's most popular open source intrusion detection system. The success of Snort as an open source project led Marty to found Sourcefire in Columbia, Maryland in 2001, growing it from a local startup to a cybersecurity powerhouse that Cisco ultimately acquired for $2.7 billion in 2013. A pillar of the DMV tech community, Marty has been recognized by eWeek as a top 100 most influential person in IT, and his innovations have significantly influenced network security practices worldwide. Today, he continues to drive innovation at Notography, where he and his team are fundamentally redefining how networks are secured. Roche's journey from a Maryland-based entrepreneur to a global cybersecurity leader exemplifies the DMV's rich history as a hub for tech innovation and talent. Marty, thanks for being here. Uh, Will Ackerley. Um, Will is, first of all, one of the smartest people I've ever met in my entire life. He is the co-founder of CTO and uh, at Vir co-founder and CTO at Virtue. He is a uh, foremost expert on cryptography worldwide. Will's journey in cybersecurity began at the NSA, where he spent eight years developing cloud analytics and security architecture, specifically for protecting the agency's in-house data transfer. During his tenure at the NSA, he invented the Trusted Data Format, an open standard used today by numerous government agencies for secure data transfer. In 2012, alongside his brother, John Ackerley, Will co-founded Virtue in Washington, DC. Today, Will and his teammates continue to innovate on top of the open TDS standard, delivering a cutting edge platform and a portfolio of data-centric security applications that are used by more than 6,700 customers worldwide across private and public sectors. Uh, a prolific inventor with 25 patents, Will was named in 2016 to Fortune's 40 under 40 list. Ackerley's expertise in cryptography and data access control have made him a respected voice, not only in the DMV tech system, but across the world. Thank you, Will, for being here. Um, so with that, I want to kind of start off with a similar sort of question that, that John Funge asked his, his two panelists and talk about a personal journey and have you kind of take four or five minutes each. Um, I'll start with you, Will. Uh, can you just kind of share your backstory in your own words, the journey that you've taken within software and cyber and at a high level kind of, you know, things that you've observed along the journey that, that stick with you as kind of like foundational? Thank, thank you for the question. So a lot like the uh, deputy mayor, uh, I started my career as a non-software engineer. So I was hap <laughs> happily ensconced in um, microchip design in Austin, Texas at AMD. 
And I told my boss, I was like, this is going to be my career. Love you guys. Love this work. I love hardware. And then I got a call saying, hey, you passed your full scope poly polygraph. Um, and I shocked. Um, so that meant I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, truly shocking. Um, <laughs> So what that meant is I had a full, uh, a, a an unqualified job offer to NSA, as you as you were saying, um, doing hardware design. So that started my career at NSA uh, in 2004, and I started on a program called CryptoMod, crypto modernization. Um, so the way that we encrypted things was we built large boxes, and they were focused on network protection. Um, and our job was to figure out how to make them a lot more secure and a, like a lot faster. Um, and then six months in, they said, wait, crypto mod is actually not just hardware. It's software. We're going to, these things are clunky. They're expensive. So let's turn this problem into a software problem. So that's how I became a software engineer, uh, retrained. Um, and I thought, cool. Right, this is going to solve the problem of protecting data because right now it's super clunky. Um, these things don't, they just help you keep data um, stuck in whatever network you put it on, basically. So if you put it on a top secret network, it's going to live there forever. That's the, the design. Um, and then we implemented it and it didn't solve the fundamental dot connecting problem. Mm. 17 failed programs we, we looked at all right, banging our head against the wall. How are we going to solve this problem? That's where the, the TDF, the trusted data format um, came to be focusing, you know, it's, it's the data stupid. So instead of trying to protect the network, protect the data in 2009 and 10, that became an NSA standard. And then um, the, the broader community adopted that in 2012. So then it was an ODNI national intelligence uh, data standard. And at that point, really, um, the fundamental barrier to adoption for everybody else was ease of use. And the crucible that would prove that we could do that level of protection for everybody else would be the consumer. So my brother and I, started virtue with that as the starting point we got to focus on making sure that individuals can protect their data too and then from there um releasing open tdf mm -hmm. it's one thing to have an open standard it's another thing to have a credible piece of software that actually helps you do it and that was not that long ago um so that was a huge milestone for us um you know getting that out into the community and seeing what's happening with that um and and a credible open community has unlocked a lot most recently just in terms of like a wave top having a coalition community like the five eyes mm -hmm. um right so us canada great britain australia new zealand all coming together and saying you know what we're going to protect and share our data this way too um so that was relatively recent i won't get ahead of another coalition but i feel like any day now they're going to yeah. say the same thing fascinating Thank you, Will. Um, Marty, um, same question. Like, what's the, what's the backstory? What's the journey? And what what do you look back on and reflect? It's just like kind of key lessons learned. Yeah. Um, well, it's been circuitous for sure. Uh, so, uh, grew up in the cornfields of Western New York, uh, and in about 1995 or so, I found myself in Albuquerque, New Mexico, working for SAIC. And uh, uh, unbeknownst to most of you, uh, Ron Gula and I went to college together. So one day, uh, Ron's in the Air Force working at NSA, and I'm on the phone with him. And he said, hey, there's a job available at this contractor that we work with across the street. Maybe you want to ch check it out. So uh, I was looking to get out of Albuquerque. Um, and this is in Maryland. I said, OK, this sounds great. <laughs> so I applied for the job, got off for the job on the spot. Um, and this is my background is uh, computer engineering. Um, so it's computer engineering stuff with a bent towards information security, which is what we called it at the time. So I got the job and I moved to Maryland and started working uh, at this company and, um, you know, working on information security projects. And, uh, you, you know, if you started doing security in the 90s, you taught yourself, especially if you're technical. You had to teach yourself. And the way that I did it was looking at other people's software, writing 
my own tools, um, working on the problems that we were working on uh, at work, and then just kind of um, doing my thing. And eventually, uh, I got to the point where uh, one weekend I went home and I wanted to try writing a cross-platform sniffer. I'd written some sniffers, uh, packet sniffers for inspecting network traffic um, at work. And I thought, well, it'd be fun to write one that was cross-platform. I'll use this uh, libpcap thing that's out there these days. So I sat down and wrote it in a weekend, and I called it S for sniff. Um, and uh, anyway, I played around with it for about a month. And the whole idea was, hey, you know what? I'm going to leave this thing running while I'm at work. And when I come home at night, I'm going to look through what's been poking at my network since I've been at the office. You know, shouldn't be anything there. This is when networks were pretty quiet. Shouldn't be anything there. And lo and behold, there was always stuff there. I was like, oh, that's interesting. So eventually, I started uh, adding some more features to it. And um, at the same time, this is 1998, kind of the fall of 98, uh, Linux was getting a lot of momentum, the open source. Um, Communities were starting to percolate, and the Cathedral and the Bazaar um, uh -huh. treatise on kind of the different way of doing community-driven software development was out there. And I thought, hey, you know what? Maybe I should release this as an open source project. Maybe I'll get a couple of downloads, get a few emails. It'll be fun. Sure. So I did. Uh, I released it. Up until that point, you were the only person that ever contributed to it? Yeah, I was okay. like, this is like literally five weeks into it. Mm -hmm. So I was like, right. hey, I'm going to do an open source project. See, you know, maybe I'll get an email out of it. It'll be entertaining. Um, so uh, I released it on uh, packetstorm.com, which was the big uh, tool site of the day, and did get a few emails, got a few, uh, um, you know, bug reports, and it'd be cool if you could do this kind of things. So I did another release, and I got some more emails, and I did another release. And this is my day job, is I'm working for, you know, Fort Meade. So we'd work on project for six months, give it to the customer, not hear back from them for six months, and then they'd call up, they'd be like, hey, the installer didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so you rev, get it out there six months later. Okay, we got to the first prompt, and like, what number should we put in here? And it'll just be like that. So this was like, do a release, instant feedback, do a release, instant right. feedback. I did 30, 23 releases of Snore in the first year that it was out, because this is like catnip. I'm like, oh, here's more, here's more. And it's just more and more feedback, but also the open source you know, snowball starting to go. So it was really captivating for me as an engineer, because it wasn't just add a feature, here's a bug. It was like, what if it could do this? What if it could do that? So I started adding those features to it. And eventually I developed the, uh, what is, um, well, what evolved into the Snort rules language um, that is still out there today. And it's like one of the standards that the, the world uses for describing network-based attacks. Um, and it was just, you know, it was this really captivating way to develop software. It was just like, for me, it was like this it was gamifying doing software releases. And as it got bigger and bigger, it got harder and harder because if you screwed up more and more people saw it, <laughs> which was like this fiery hoop that kept getting you know smaller and more on fire as you're jumping through it every time. So uh, eventually I got to the point- The I got perils recruited. of success. Right. <laughs> so I got recruited by a startup on the back of Snort. They're like, you're the guy who wrote Snort. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, you want to come work at our startup? And I said, sure. I worked there for about 10 months and it imploded under its founder's ego, uh, which is interesting. And it was a West Coast startup. I had never you know, been exposed to the West Coast, East Coast system or anything like that. But I left there and I came home and I was like, well, what am I gonna do with myself? And you know, by this point, Snort's a real thing. This is a couple of years in. Um, and I'm getting job offers uh, pretty rapidly. But I thought, man, you know, I got a, I got a survey from the SANS Institute and this is, you know, SANS put out a thing. They said, uh, amongst all the other survey questions, uh, what intrusion detection system do you use? And check all that apply. So they'd have like, you know, NetRanger and ISS Real Secure and NFR and stuff like that, but Snort was also on it. And the guy said, Sans came back to me. They were like, "Hey, Snort got checked ninety-two percent of the time." And I was like, "Holy crap!" What year was that? This is nine. No, this is two thousand. This is okay. the fall of two thousand. That's when you said, "Let's start a company." Right. Exactly. <laughs> I said, "If I don't figure out how to make money on this, somebody else will." So right. all I have to do is figure out how to get people to pay for something that's free. Not a problem. Seems pretty straightforward. So I uh, uh, came up with a business model, which is now called the Open Core Business Model. Um, so I don't just do software, I also do business models. Uh, and um, started SourceFire in my, literally, literally in my living room. Uh, and SourceFire went from my living room to public company in six years. And then uh, we got acquired by Cisco for closing on $3 billion six years after that. Um, so it was great, nice ride. I got to become the chief architect for security business group at Cisco. For almost six years, and then I left that, and I decided, hey, you know, it'd be fun. Let's do another startup. That's what I'm doing today. 
Cool, cool. And so the, the, keep me honest, does Notography have any kind of open sort of core or? We, we have open source components that we have out on GitHub and things like that. And actually right now we're in the midst of uh, moving our go-to-market to a more product-led growth model, but we are a SaaS product, so yep. it's more kind of free trial kind of thing. Right. So what, what you know, I'm not entirely sure how, how, how many people in the, in the audience show of hands, um, are software developers and have ever interacted with an open source project. Okay. That's probably about a third. Um, one thing I had, had an interesting conversation yesterday with, with our general counsel, Mishi and, and, you know, I, I've had the pleasure of being around, you know, a couple of companies that had open source at the core and spent seven years at a company called Sonotype. And we're about to hear from Brian Fox, who's got his own fascinating journey through the open community and in, in the next panel, but, well, and Marty both. I mean, I'll start with you, Will. I mean, people say open source, in, you know, in terms of like software innovation as a path to creating value for shareholders, right? And building a company and, and ultimately maybe building a category. I'd love for you to kind of comment about your, your specific view of like the open standard and to your point, what subsequently became open TDF and how the project with a material, like a, a functional piece of software coupled with a standard you know, even though it's on early in the journey for us, how that sort of changes perspective in terms of like people that might be interested in looking at us as a business partner, how do they view us when we're having that conversation, the scope of the open project versus how they might view someone if they're just purely proprietary. What What's to your view, the power of open is you see the go to market model as, as uh, you know, uh, an engineer. Yeah, it's been transformative. There are entire industries where it would be very difficult to have the conversation if we didn't have both the open standard and the software that can materially make it happen. Um, and we're, you know, as a company making it easy and differentiated on top. Um, I remember three of the largest banks in the US all saying, we are not going to buy into this. We've been burned in the past with unintentional ransomware mm. because the underlying capability is proprietary. Um, so that's like just one, one industry and then rinse and repeat. That is true for IOT. It's true in the government. Um, and so once that project was open, um, we could go back and say, Hey, like here it is. And then partners, being able to build and extrapolate on top of that, right? Um, so it's really changed the game from, um, you know, the objection. So many of the object the objections that we used to have just have evaporated. It, it, it does it, it does the customer in that conversation or potential business partner in that conversation sort of you know is there is it the fact that you have some open standard and open core does it. Um, make them less defensive? Does it make them somehow, um, I'm just curious, what, what do you think it does to their men mental mind, you know, when they're looking at you as a partner? Yeah, I mean, on, as a, I mean, a lot of our customers are also really partners as well, um, right? Because they're buying into the data centric approach. Hey, we're moving from the network protection to the data. What does this look like? Um, and knowing that the other pieces of the ecosystem um, can connect mm. because it's not just about the data. It's being able to say, okay, I've, I've protected this data and now I need to make sure exactly who is trying to get access. That's an identity problem. And you, you can't build out an end to end capability if you can't plug into yep. all of those other aspects. And a lot of people have framed that as like zero trust. Yep. Right. But very, very concretely, and it's a set of technologies that you click together. So you get the yes or no on the data. Right. Um, and you can't do that. You just can't tell that story effectively um, if it's proprietary. Yep. I haven't seen anything yep. be successful yep. there. Marty, uh, we'll, we'll use the word differentiated. He, he was um, you know, talking about what what where the, the company is sort of investing and in sort of value on top of the open. And you, in your prologue, were talking about um, writing the rules on top of the open. I'm just curious, what, as you were going through the journey, how, how did you make decisions with respect to what you were giving away for free 
versus when you started Sourcefire, what you intentionally decided was going to be the thing that was literally going to unlock value and cause people to pay for it. Yeah. So you have to, you know, you have to figure out what the value lies and what people are actually willing to pay for. So in the enterprise for intrusion detection and prevention systems, everybody wants the function and they'd like it to be um, kind of what they expect. Most of the other products were black boxes. We were open. Uh, most of the guys who were doing it had learned from me at SANS how to do intrusion detection using my tooling. So that's what they expected, which was a little, you know, stealth uh, marketing uh, back before I had the intention really of building Sourcefire, but that's another story. Um, but the thing that people are really willing to pay for in the enterprise that I've figured out for the types of things that we were doing, which is appliances, you know, like we need to control the horizontal and the vertical of the deployment. So it needs to be on appliances and it needs to work a certain way and look a certain way and be supportable and all that other stuff. So the things that people really were willing to pay for as enterprise customers wasn't so much the intrusion detection and prevention function, which we were delivering, but you could get for free. It was manageability, scalability, performance, automation, and support. If you tried to build those things yourself, it was a fabulously expensive exercise uh -huh. that you had to curate forever, or you could buy it from the guys who built the core technology that you already love and are using. Um, and that's usually an easy, easy discussion. And yeah, there's, you know, there's always the shops who are like, oh, we built it in-house, we're gonna keep it that way. But usually those shops lasted, you know, my sales guys didn't like this. I'd be, you know, we'd lose a deal because they're like, oh, they're, they're doing snort in-house by themselves. I said, they'll be back in three to five years. They're right. like, that does not help me. I was like, well, it's good. I'm, I'm going to be fine. <laughs> you maybe not so much, but I'm, gonna, I'm doing great. Three to five years when they come back, I'm going to take that. It's going to go on the top of the pile. Um, anyway, so yeah, it was uh, um, just this, you know, this differentiation. But I said very specifically, to my senior management team as I hired them on board. If you come in here, you have to understand we are an enterprise security player, but Snore is always going to be open source and we are going to devote as much energy as we can to making it the best thing in the world for doing its job and giving that away for free because we need everybody's eyes to stay on our tech and not wander off to other people's tech. So it's always got to be the most cutting edge thing that we can make it. And we have to invest a lot of money in that. And you're going to be okay with that because the people who have the actual problem that we solve, which is manageability support, you know, support automation performance. Um, those people are always going to have that problem and they're always going to, they're going to self-identify, right? Snort on the small scale solves problems, snort on the large scale causes problems and the problems that it caused are different than the ones that it solves. Snort gone wild is your best friend when it comes to monetizing. Exactly. Yeah. 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 What I really want people to do is get in way over their heads. <laughs> right. And then like, just have to call me. Um, so back to you, Marty, on this, that journey that you were on, you know, it's, it, it sounds like it was a very organic thing. We talk about like, everybody uses the term open and, and, you know, there's different license types, there's different strategies, there's different, you know, reasons for opening versus not, there's different ways to draw the, the line with respect to what's in the open, what's proprietary, you know, investors and shareholders sometimes are very opinionated about this stuff. Like, wait, I just invested how much and you're going to do what? Give this away for free. Like explain that to me. Like, so, so, so to your point, it's not just about the engineering and sort of having a project that you can put out there that solves the itch for some portion of the developer community that wants to engage, but there's a business model too. H how much of that were you kind of tuned into as you were getting started versus how much of that did you have to figure out along the way? Well, um, I tend to think about things for a long time before I like try to execute on them, like pieces of software I've written, you know, I've thought about for literally years before I've sat down and tried to write them. Uh, and this was kind of similar. And, you know, when I was coming up with, uh, it was actually a pretty short burn process. I never even thought I would ever start a company until six months before I did. And then four months before I did was when I left um, the startup I was at. And I started thinking about how can I monetize Snort? Like, how can I get people to pay for something that's free? And I had lots of advice, put it on CD-ROMs and sell it at CompUSA or, you know, do whatever, you know, all, all these different things, sell the software, sell as a service, do all this stuff. I was like, nah, I'm a product guy. I like building products. I'm going to build a product, but I just need to figure out what this business model is going to be. So I sat and I like literally thought about it for a long time. And I came up with the model that I came up with because the insight that I had was what I just told you guys. 
you only got three or four snort sensors, anybody can manage that. If you got 300 snort sensors, nobody can manage that. And that's a huge problem. And the people who happen to have that problem also, also happen to have a lot of money. So right. I'm going to build for them. And that was the uh, that was kind of the, the genesis of it. Um, and I got a lot of doors slammed in my face uh, when I raised money or tried to raise money. Uh, I spent close to a year before anybody took me seriously at all. And I got told that's a dumb idea. It'll never work a lot by some very, you know, uh, big Silicon Valley veterans. Nope, that's stupid. You're dumb. You're an engineer. Why do you think you can invent a business model? I'm like, because like I thought about it for a long time. I'm like, get out. <laughs> um, that was kind of how it went. And then we actually, you know, landed our first four customers, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Intel, GE Aerospace, and, or not GE Aerospace, um, International Paper and uh, SAIC. No relation that, you know, they didn't even remember that I had worked there. Uh, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden the VCs are like, oh, you actually can get people to pay for this? Okay, let's talk. So, Will, uh, you know, he said, I think four or five months, you, you weren't, it was four or five months before you started the company that you realized you were going to do it. I'm curious, as you were kind of going through the journey and, and thinking about innovating around TDF and, and imagining kind of leaving and starting Virtue with your brother, John, you know, what was that like? And, and you understood at that time, or, or did you fully understand in your mind this concept of open and, and TDF is a standard and then subsequently envision the open source project that would eventually become like how much of your entrepreneurial instincts at that time before starting this company were powered by this view of open. A lot of it was really just focused on the problem at hand. And it was, it was just like, it was a hope beyond hope that um, it would evolve into such a robust open source project above and beyond just the spec that was a government spec. Um, and, you know, very different from Marty's experience. I did not sit and ponder the business model problem. I had no idea how to even start. And that's, but it was conversations with John, my brother, um, when we all came home, you know, he came back to New from New York and, I was here and we, you know, over Thanksgiving um, dinners and stuff, just understand like, actually this, this can be a business. It's not just a hard problem that everyone else has to protect their privacy online um, as um, you know, it's something that we could actually um, tackle as a business. And so the standard and the opportunity to innovate on TDF, the spec was central to the decision to start the company, but the journey to open took some time. Quite a while. Mm. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, we we're starting with email. We're like, you know, let's, let's just knock out the email problem mm -hmm. and then quickly move on. It took, I don't know, eight years um, before we could really significantly uh, pivot um, to other aspects of the problem to become a multi-product company and not just you know tackle email it's a yeah. hard problem you've done a good job of it but um yeah it took it was a very you know long journey for that arc we had in a uh an investor deck um this notion of go out into the individual privacy community offer a free product innovate make sure it's awesome sell the small businesses sell the large sell the large businesses engage with the government, which I loved as an incubator of mm -hmm. the next horizon mm -hmm. and then circle it back. Similar to what John Doyle was describing a little bit earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Um, Marty, um, on the journey, public company, you know, hired Wayne along the way, eventually, uh, you know, had a nice business. You know, there was a journey that eventually led to Cisco. Like, what, what was that about? I mean, do you ever, I don't know, maybe this isn't fair, but do you ever sit here and sort of go, man, I wish we hadn't sold it to Cisco because it's still the world's most popular IDS open source. You know, I mean, yeah. uh, what, what was that like? Well, it was interesting uh, for sure. Um, yeah, kind of the, the late days of Sourcefire before we got bought by Cisco, um, there was a lot of stuff going on in the business. So we were at that point, the preeminent IDS IPS player in the space we were building next generation firewall in fact we had released it 
but we had also bought Aminet, which was an early EDR company, one of the pioneers in EDR. Uh, and we were releasing our own EDR as well. So we were like very full spectrum, like, you know, endpoint or, you know, network, blah, blah, blah. And um, so things were going okay, but, you know, we also had like, there were a lot of developments happening in the industry as well. FireEye was coming up and Palo Alto were coming up at the same time. And they were on, you know, two different flanks of where we were going. So FireEye was, you know, spinning this tale that, oh, we can detect malware. We don't need signatures anymore and do all this other, you know, magic. And um, so that whole thing was going on. They were incredibly well-funded. And then Palo Alto was coming up at the same time, also incredibly well-funded, uh, with no expectation of profitability anytime soon. So we had this kind of three-front war that we're fighting between you know, us and them. And I was the CEO of Sourcefire in early 2013. Uh, the CEO, my second CEO that I'd hired, uh, John Burris, had uh, developed cancer and had to leave the business. So I got the Battlefield promotion. So this is like, okay, well, this is getting complicated. And I got on uh, the phone with, you know, uh, we did our earnings call in uh, whatever, February, right before RSA. Um, and uh, I told Wall Street I was going to hold our net operating margins flat for the year to free up. It was either like 12 or $16 million of uh, cash to put him to go to market to go fight this three-front war with Palo Alto and FireEye and the rest of the IDS IPS industry. This is going to be complicated. So we go to RSA and um, Cisco is like really wanting to meet with us at RSA. So we go there and, um, you know, basically they try to engineer their own next gen firewall. Um, for whatever reason, it had not gone well. I'm not going to uh, editorialize. Uh, and the project had fallen on his face essentially. And they were like, we really need next generation firewall. And we said, well, we've got that. And we also have, you know, we have EDR as well. It wasn't called EDR. It was, you know, whatever next gen AV at the time. And, you know, so we started going around and around and around and um, we figured out, oh, these guys are actually serious. Like they really, right. <laughs> they're right. serious. Right. So they must've done the market survey and realized that, you know, they can either try to go Palo Alto. They bought a company or two in their day. Right, exactly. <laughs> um, so yeah, we uh, went around and eventually I, I end up in a, you know, office out in uh, San Jose, um, you know, in a, this uh, little side office down the hall from uh, John Chambers' uh, office, and me and John Chambers are there, and he wants to understand like what I think about security. So I draw out my whole model, you know, all the the stuff that we developed uh, in the Sourcefire days, and you know, he he loved it, and made me promise that if they bought us, I'd stick around for at least four years. So I said, sure thing, because uh, I I knew what the numbers were looking like. <laughs> I was like, for for three billion dollars, yes, John, for you, absolutely. Um, so uh, yeah, we decided to go for it, but you know. It was a better together story. And when I was in the room with John, I said, John, you know, my chief holdback on this is look across the security industry in the last 10 years and find me the deal that was done where a big acquirer uh, picked up a, a sector leader and it was good for the customers of the guys who got bought. And he was like, yeah, you're right. It's, uh, you know, it hasn't gone well for the most part, but, you know, we're really going to uh, reemphasize security. And, you know, for a brief shining moment, we had a lot of momentum and we, we built a lot of great stuff. But eventually, you know, Cisco like has shiny object syndrome, and they they go chase some little blockchain or whatever, uh, and uh, you get you know start getting your budget skinny down and things like that. But you know, it was great, and you know, Sourcefire business went from 250 million a year to if you look at their NGFW and EDR business, it's probably close to two billion dollars a wow. year. Wow! Uh, wow! So that's not, amazing. Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Um, last question for both of you. Um, when you think about the landscape today, Will, as you look out and you think about what TDF and Open TDF represent, what makes you most optimistic about where we could go, or where you, you know, collectively it could go, and anything give you sort of reason for pause? I think accelerating awareness that you can protect your data, independent of where it is. Like you don't have to. Um, it doesn't have to get stuck and, and you can share it. it stuck and, inside of a network or a silo or something like that. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, you know, it, if you've put your protections in a, in a, in a network, um, it can get stuck if you have, if you can't move those to the data. So the awareness there, particularly the government with zero trust, um, and the adoption rates are accelerating there. Um, seeing others build on top, and extrapolate on that value and say, hey, I love this approach and I'm going to keep going. We're working with other countries 
who are now building their own expansion on the open stack. Um, and like in, in, like in Europe, for example, where they want sovereignty over their data. And it used to be, hey, I'm going to build my own internet, right? That was sort of like the, the visceral reaction. That doesn't work, obviously. Um, so, but having their own sovereign control mechanisms for data that they care about anchored in the data. And then, you know, with a lot of the threats to trustworthiness of data mm. um, around AI um, and seeing what's happening in complementary projects, you know, we're, we're a member of C2PA, mm -hmm. um, you know, the Coalition for Content, um, Provenance and Authenticity. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so many organizations like big hitters are contributing to that. So as a counter to, um, you know, disinformation and being able to say, hey, if, if this is something that I have created, I approved or I classified, anyone can look at that and prove to themselves, yep, that has not been tampered with. Yep. Um, and from a, from a pause standpoint, um, I think there is still an awareness gap and I don't know how quickly this approach is going to become the expectation. So if you see a photograph, if you see a video, you assume it's not real unless it comes with a signature like that. Um, I'm thinking of one, one case in particular relatively recently where a police officer was able to edit their um, body worn camera video and make it look like what he said, which was wrong, um, incorrect, uh, was true. And it wasn't, and it was only because he was a poor editor did the judge figure out what, you know, and, and we have an opportunity, I think, you know, um, but yeah. Provenance of data. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I, and that, and what we're working on, I think is yeah, cool. Can we start that? Um, Marty, how about you? What, what kind of, you know, as you sit here today, look out over the landscape, what makes you, what gives you optimism and what gives you pause? for the industry, for, 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 you know, the big picture. Yeah. For, for the industry, I think, um, you know, I, I think at a high level, we're like coalescing on more sensible security, defensible architectures. Zero yeah. trust is a good example, for example, for one part. Um, but, uh, there are other things like taking data security seriously and having standards and, and even driven by open, uh, standards, I think, is really important, and the adoption and understanding um, that you know, open source is actually you, you know, back when I got started, you have some segment of customers who are like, oh, well, if it's open source, the bad guys can see you know how you're doing, what you're doing, and they can use that to get around you. It's like, no, actually, that just forces you to build it the right way, uh, you know, and so on and so forth. So I, I think you know, being much more adult about how open source and open standards work. Uh, things like, um, you know, fundamentally software, bill of materials, uh, kinds of things, taking data security mm -hmm. seriously, taking identity security seriously, um, so that the, the underpinnings are more foundationally secure, I think is, is cause for a lot of hope. Uh, I think the, you know, I'll point, a, point out AI is kind of the, the threat on the horizon right now. I talk with, a, with my wife about it uh, sometimes and, you know, I tell her at home, like what I'm really worried about for AI right now is kind of AI's Facebook moment where it goes from mm -hmm. social networks were kind of benign until Facebook came along. And then all of a sudden it's like, what if you took a bunch of amoral people and then set them loose on what would get people to right. like maximize dollars generated by the social network? Oh, I know. Well, manipulate people's dopamine loops uh, and, you know, and rage would be a really great way to do that. Like not a bad business model, not a bad business model, <laughs> kind of caustic to, I don't know, civilization, but Good business model. Um, anyway, so AI's Facebook moment is out there somewhere, and you know, we'll see what happens when we get there. So you've got that, and then you've got you know all the stuff that's going on behind the scenes uh, right now with all the um, you know AI-driven uh, um, inauthentic uh, data and things like that. I'm helping out a company right now that's um, like securing Zoom channels essentially so that you can't inject you know fake avatars into Zoom, for example. Um, so that's, I think, the next frontier of like malfeasance that mm -hmm. is going to be very challenging uh, for us to deal with. And things like what you guys are doing to anchor authenticity uh, is actually super duper important. But, you know, like arraying ourselves to deal with the world that's coming because they're not just coming 
with technical means are also going after our, our very soft users who are you know the same people who keep clicking on links in their email uh, are the guys who are, who are going to say, oh, my password is you know Snow Bunny, and they'll be like, excellent. You know, the AI will transmit that off to wherever. Yeah, yeah, and one of the things um, that's fascinating, I just want to, to play on that comment. You said arraying ourselves for the future. I mean, a lot of it comes down to architecture. I mean, you could argue, and I've heard you talk before in the past about one of the things that you got right with Snow Art, and to your point, you spent a ton of time thinking about architecture for the long term. And, you know, Will, I know that you spent a ton of time thinking about architecture for this concept of data-centric security, and here we are. And to the extent that we ar array and align ourselves for the future, architecture, in any sense, security architecture has to change um, because what we know to be true over the last 20, 30 years hasn't generally worked. And so the future is bright and the future is sobering. And, you know, I thank you both very, very much for being here and sharing your perspectives. And uh, thank you. All right. Thanks.